In a previous video, we discussed the energetics of reactions of stereoisomers, the similarities and differences. In this video, we're going to focus on groups within a single molecule that share a stereotopic relationship. And as you might imagine by now, there's a correspondence between the way that stereoisomers behave and the way that the analogously related stereotopic groups behave. So the energetics here are, in a sense, just going to reinforce what we already know about how stereoisomers behave. Homotopic groups, such as the two hydroxyls in the molecule shown here, are in identical environments. This means that they react to give a single molecule. Put another way, there's absolutely no difference energetically between either of these hydroxyl groups reacting. If we call the starting material A and the product B, there's only one possible reaction pathway that leads from the reactants to the products. Reaction of the other hydroxyl group to generate the molecule shown here would just lead to B exactly. In other words, if I label this C, well, B is exactly the same as C. And so there's absolutely no difference between the reaction pathways here. The convenient thing about this is that we can use either hydroxyl group without any fear of generating a different product, whether we use one or the other. Diastereotopic groups, such as the two hydroxyls shown here, are in different spatial environments. As a result, reactions of one or the other of a pair of diastereotopic groups leads to two different diastereomeric products and you can verify that these two molecules that are shown as the products are in fact diastereomers. So if we now label the reactant A and the two possible products B and C, now the two pathways leading to B and C have completely different energy profiles. As was the case when we discussed reactions of diastereomers, we're not going to worry about how to predict which pathway is more favorable, the one leading to B or C. What we can appreciate, however, is how the diastereotopic relationship between the groups tells us that these reaction pathways will be different. And this is true whether the reaction conditions involved are achiral, as they are here, or chiral, which I haven't shown, but which would give the same result. The hydroxyl groups are in different spatial environments by virtue of being diastereotopic. That has nothing to do with whether the reaction conditions are achiral or chiral. The practical punchline from all this is that diastereotopic groups react to yield diastereomers, which have different energies, with different rates because the activation energies leading to the two diastereomers, delta G double dagger C and delta G double dagger B, are necessarily different, and different yields, and the yields have to do both with this activation energy difference and with the difference in the overall free energy changes in the reaction pathways leading from A to B and from A to C. The yields of B and C will be unequal regardless of the reaction conditions. We've seen that homotopic groups always behave the same way, and diastereotopic groups always behave in different ways. The enantiotopic case is where things get really interesting. The energetics of reactions of enantiotopic groups depend on the chirality of the molecule or molecules that they're reacting with. When enantiotopic groups react with achiral reagents, the result is a pair of enantiomers. Here's an example of a reaction of two enantiotopic hydroxyl groups to yield a pair of enantiomers that we looked at in a previous video. Because the products are enantiomers, they'll have equal energies. And so if, if we label the two enantiomers B and C on a reaction coordinate diagram, we should expect identical reaction pathways leading to both enantiomers. The mechanisms leading to the enantiomers are mirror images or enantiomeric as well. And so even the transition state and any intermediate energies involved here will also be equal. This means that we should expect that both enantiomers are generated with equal rates, and that at the end of the reaction, we get an equal yield of both enantiomers. This corresponds to a racemic mixture, right? Since a 50-50 mixture of B and C, which are enantiomeric, corresponds to a racemic mixture. When we switch the reaction conditions from achiral to chiral, all of a sudden, the result is a pair of diastereomers, and this changes the situation drastically. Here's the same reaction type, where this hydrogen is replaced with this carbonyl fragment. But the difference is this carbonyl fragment is now chiral, where it was achiral. The acetyl group is achiral in this first example. This means that the reaction conditions are now chiral. And because the chiral reagent brings along for the ride a stereocenter whose configuration does not change 
as a result of the reaction. That stereocenter isn't directly involved at all. The two products match in configuration at that stereocenter, but differ in configuration at their other two stereocenters. Consequently, these two products are diastereomers, and we should expect the energy profiles for these two reactions leading to the two diastereomers to be very different. Diastereomers B and C will have unequal energies, and all transition states and any intermediates along the pathways leading to B and C will also differ in energy because they're diastereomeric. Notice that now, simply by switching the reaction conditions from achiral to chiral, we should expect unequal rates of production of diastereomers B and C, and we should consequently expect unequal yields of B and C. To help us understand this difference between enantiotopic groups on a deeper level, I want to return to an example that we looked at at the very beginning of this video series on stereochemistry, the difference between the spoon and the coffee mug. We talked a while back about the fact that the coffee mug is chiral because of the fact that the handle sort of breaks the symmetry of the mug, while the spoon is achiral. It's got a plane of symmetry that runs right through the middle of it. Now, one way to think about your hands in the broader context of your body as a whole is that your hands are enantiotopic with respect to one another, considering that they're actually connected to your body, right? If you think of your body as a molecule, then your hands are enantiotopic within that larger molecule. One thing we saw earlier was that the spoon is equivalent whether it's being held by your right or left hand, right? This is an achiral object, and so it doesn't matter the way I hold it. In fact, the two pictures of me holding the spoon with my right and left hand are enantiomeric. This is like the first case of an achiral reagent reacting with one or the other of a pair of enantiotopic groups. The two resulting structures are enantiomeric, and so the reaction pathways leading to those structures are exactly equivalent energetically. The coffee mug, on the other hand, is chiral. As a result, interaction with the right hand versus the left hand leads to a pair of diastereomers rather than enantiomers. And now the energetic situation is different. And this demo really gives you an intuitive feel for that, right? There is an energetic difference between drinking coffee this way and the diastereomeric process of drinking coffee this way. To summarize this discussion, we can think about a stereotopic relationship as giving us insight into what's called the distinguishability of two groups within a molecule. Can reagents coming up to the molecule tell the difference or distinguish between the two groups X and X prime? This table shows us that whether two groups within a molecule are distinguishable depends on both the stereotopic relationship between them and whether the molecule approaching is achiral or chiral. And the essential question that the table answers is, can the approaching molecule tell the difference? In other words, is there an energetic di difference between the molecule approaching one group or the other? In the case of homotopic groups, of course, there is absolutely no difference. They are literally identical in every way, shape, or form, and so it doesn't matter which one we use in a reaction, whether the conditions are achiral or chiral. Diastereotopic groups are completely different. They're in completely different spatial environments, and so these are distinguishable by both achiral and chiral molecules. They're different under any and all conditions, and we should expect a difference in the yields of molecules generated through reactions of diastereotopic groups. The same is true of constitutionally heterotopic groups, of course. The enantiotopic case is where things get interesting. Chiral molecules can tell the difference between two enantiotopic groups. In other words, two enantiotopic groups are, in fact, distinguishable by a chiral molecule. However, Achiral molecules cannot tell the difference between enantiotopic groups because the resulting mechanisms or the resulting reaction pathways are enantiomeric. Enantiotopic groups are not distinguishable by achiral molecules. One last thing I'll point out is that the fact that chiral molecules can distinguish between enantiotopic groups is very important for the generation of chirality or asymmetry. The reason being that a molecule with enantiotopic groups must have a plane of symmetry, since enantiotopic groups are exchanged by a plane of symmetry within the molecule. But this is the same as being a chiral, right? So the molecule as a whole is a chiral. If we want to generate a chiral product from this a chiral starting material, 
One way to do that is to selectively react one of the two groups to generate one of a pair of enantiomers. Only chiral molecules have the ability to do this. In the next video, we'll see how enzymes, nature's chiral catalysts, accomplish these transformations by setting up beautifully tailored asymmetric environments that strongly bias reaction pathways toward one of a pair of enantiotopic groups.